As we begin uh, this morning, I invite you to take out your uh, bulletin, and on the back of your bulletin is a memory verse. Uh, we've had sort of an odd month where two weeks out of the month we haven't really reviewed it, so we typically are doing a couple verses every month of Romans chapter 8, and we're going to continue this, these couple of verses on into next month so that we have a chance to uh, work through them together and memorize them. So Romans 8, 14 to 15 is our memory passage for this month and next month and the rest of this month and next month. So I invite you to recite that with me. Romans 8, 14 and 15. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. This morning, there's one big main idea in Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 18, which is what we're going to be working through, and that is this, God honoring obedience is a gospel-produced, Christ-purchased, grace-empowered, heart-driven pursuit of God in Christ. Let me say that again. God-honoring obedience is a gospel-produced, Christ-purchased, grace-empowered, heart-driven pursuit of God in Jesus Christ. So let me just break that down for you real quick, and then we're going to go into the message. And, and this morning, really, I've got one very tiny observation and then two main points, that, and those three things will draw this out. So first, uh, it's uh, God honoring obedience. Okay, we see that in Romans six seventeen. Um, there is a type of obedience, in other words, that is not honoring to God. And so, what we're after is not God dishonoring obedience, but God honoring obedience. That's that should be our desire and our aim and our goal. And this type of God honoring obedience is gospel produced. So the first five and a half chapters of Romans is talking about the gospel. Paul is laying the gospel before us for five and a half chapters and showing us not only the gospel, but the implications or results of that gospel. So the gospel produces this kind of uh, God-honoring obedience. Second, it's, or third, it's purchased by Christ. It's Christ purchased. So for example, in John 17, verses 20 through 23, Christ says this in his high priestly prayer. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. So that's, that's us, right? We, we weren't with Christ. We are centuries removed from Christ's uh, physical ministry here on earth. So here in John 17, he is praying for us that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. In verse 23, he says, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. And so that is union with Christ language, right? So before Christ went to the cross, he prayed that we would be united with him. His death on the cross secured that answered yes to the prayer. And as a result, we have God-honoring obedience that is gospel-produced and purchased by Christ. But it's also grace-empowered. We see Romans 6, 14. We're going to get into that, that this God-honoring type of obedience is not in and of ourselves. It is empowered by grace. And it is heart-driven. That's in 6.17. So it's not just an external conformity. It's an internal transformation of the heart that is secured in the new birth and, and given to us. So this type of thing that, that, that the 
uh, writers of the Old Testament talked about when God promised, I will take out the heart of stone, I will replace it with the heart of flesh, I will cause them to walk in my statutes and obey my rules. Right? That's, that's heart-driven obedience. And this obedience is in the pursuit of God in Jesus, in the pursuit of God in Jesus Christ. So, let me pray and ask God for help, and then we're going to get into this and, and work through that. Father, show us the glorious wonders of your word. Help us to see the beauty and majesty of Christ. Father, send your spirit to transform our hearts. We confess that our obedience is not always God-honoring obedience. But as those that have been saved by your grace through faith, not of ourselves, not as a result of work so that no one may boast. We want to be your workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that you prepared beforehand that we should walk in. And so help us, Father. Bring about that internal transformation and do not let us fall into the trap of merely external modification. We ask this for your glory and for our good in Jesus' name. Amen. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members as, uh, to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will not have dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as an obedient slave, you are slaves to the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves to righteousness. First thing I want us to see in here, and this is just sort of like a very brief comment or thought. Um, well, here we are in Romans chapter 6, and we've worked through Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, in the first half of chapter 6. And what I want you to notice is that at no point during those first five and a half chapters did Paul ever say, do anything. Isn't that curious? Five and a half chapters of Romans. One third of the book before he ever gets into anything that has to do with doing. What has he been talking about? Well, he's been talking about what Christ has done, who Christ is, what our situation was apart from Christ, what Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection did and secured and purchased to, for us, what that has done for us and implications of being united with Christ, that we are not represented by Adam any longer, but we're represented by Christ, that just as Adam was disobedient and we were guilty in him, so Christ also, in, a, in an opposite way, Christ was obedient, and through union with him, his obedience is counted as ours, that we've been reconciled to God, that we've been counted righteous, that Christ became sin for us so that we could be the righteousness of God in 1 Corinthians. He's been explaining how God is just and righteous and upholding his holiness in punishing our sin upon Christ. Five and a half chapters of that. And then he says in verse 12, Therefore, on the basis of all that I've explained about the gospel, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. The first imperative in the entire book of Romans, comes in Romans chapter 6, verse 12. So why does he spend so much time talking about Christ, what Christ did before saying what to do? Okay, I've got sort of three reflections on this, and uh, here, here's, what, here's what I think. Number one, I think we jump to do way too quickly. We launch and catapult ourselves directly into do. That's how we're wired. That's how we've been raised. That's the society that we live in. 
we've been marinating in this like soup of doing so much so that it exudes out of our pores now. And, and we never stop to question what causes us to do. Second reason I think he spends so much time on it is because what Christ has done in his death, burial, and resurrection, in his life, in his God-honoring, perfect obedience to the Father, in his justification of sinners, in counting his righteousness as ours and counting our sin as his, in bringing us into acceptance in the presence of the Father on the merits of Christ, what Christ has done is the basis for new life. New life does not come and then you go to what Christ did. What Christ did is the basis for new life in us. Meaning, apart from the work of Christ, apart from faith in Christ, none of that new life exists. And so Paul wanted to be abundantly clear before he got to any sort of action on our part or doing on our part that the basis for anything that we do that is God-honoring is Christ and his work and our union with him. Number three, what Christ has done is the fuel for new living. I think the reason Paul spent five and a half chapters talking about what Christ has done before he got to any do is because you can't do without the done. You can't have God honoring obedience here now in this life without Christ's perfect God honoring obedience being counted to you. You cannot live out practically what it means to be a new person without being born again in Jesus Christ. You can't have the proper motivations and affections and desires that drive and fuel that obedience without looking to Christ and seeing what he did and being enamored with the grace of God in our lives. Finally, number four, I think that Paul spent so much time talking about what Christ did before saying what to do because he wants to ensure that Christ gets the glory for our obedience and we don't try to rob him of that. So let's reverse it. Let's say Paul said, do this, do this, do this, do this. Oh, and by the way, Christ died for your sins. Because that, there, there is a gospel that says that. It's called Mormonism. Mormonism says you need to obey and then Christ will make up for all of the mess-ups that you had if you believe in him. It starts with obedience and Christ sort of fills in the gaps of our obedience. Sort of like we're the tiles and he's the spackle in between the tiles and just sort of seals it all up so that we're good. And that's not the gospel. Because if your obedience is the basis for your acceptance before God and Jesus just contributes a little bit, who gets the glory? Moreover, if he starts saying do, let me, let me illustrate it another way. There was a young, rich young man that came to Jesus one time. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know the commandments. Do not steal, do not do this, do not do this. This is what external conformity to moral standards apart from internal transformation looks like. I did all that. I'm good. Jesus. But think about that, right? You're standing before the God of the universe, and he's saying, here's what you have to do to inherit eternal life. The reason I'm here right now, by the way, parenthetical statement, is because you can't do this, and you fail to do this. And this rich young man has the audacity to say, I've done all of that stuff. So what does Jesus do? He pokes him right in his weakness. He says, okay, go ahead. Good. I'm glad you've done all that. Go sell everything that you have. I know you're rich. Go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and then come follow me. And this rich young ruler walked away sad because he loved his money. Now, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. Did he really keep all the commandments. If we mix this up, that's what we end up with. We get glory. We get the credit. So Paul wants to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so 
What Paul is doing is he's just laying out what new life. So if you look at 6.4, it says, um, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So he's laying out what newness of life looks like. He's laying out what living to God looks like in verse 14. Or I'm sorry, verse 10 or 11. So consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. And so new living, transformation, actually God-honoring obedience involves the objective reality that you have actually died to sin through union with Christ. And therefore, as those who have died to sin with Christ and have been raised in him, the result is we walk in newness of life. Do you, do you have to tell a baby to cry? Babies are alive, therefore they cry. Right? What about breathing? Is anybody here consciously like, I need to keep breathing right now? We breathe because we're alive. Right? That's the point of Paul waiting five and a half chapters. This is who you are, Christian. If you have been born again, if you have trusted in Christ, you are fundamentally changed. You are not who you once were. You are alive in God, in Christ. You are alive to God. You see him, you love him, you treasure him, and now just live that way. So what Christ has done, trusting in that, leads to newness of life. And if you mess that order up, by the way, you lose Christianity. What Christ has done is the fuel for genuine transformation, not merely external behavior modification. So the basis for sin not having dominion over you is that you are in Christ, you are under grace, and you are not under the law. So, Gospel produced, Christ purchased, right there. Here's the problem, though. We're we're all here right now. If if you're thinking with me right now, you're saying, wait a minute, I still struggle with sin, right? Maybe even, like right now, there's something that happened on the road here between you and your spouse or between you and your children, I'm struggling with sin still. The struggle with sin is real. Sin still has an appeal even to those who are dead. So what do we do with that? That's the question that we're left with. And the answer comes from Paul. He says, what, basically, what Christ has done for us actually does enable us to live in grace-empowered obedience. That's point number two. So point number one was Paul spends five and a half chapters about what Christ has done before he gets to any sort of imperative of do. And the basis for our doing is what Christ has done. You have been transformed by Christ. Now live like a transformed person. I don't feel very transformed. I still struggle with sin. So point number two, what Christ has done actually enables us to live in grace-empowered obedience. Let me put it another way. What Christ has done for us allows us to carry out the indicatives that Paul is about to lay out. So in verse 14, here's what we see. This is really interesting. Verse 14 of chapter 6. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. Verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? So here's the moralist coming in. This is the Jewish moralist that shows up. and says, wait a minute, Paul. Does that mean... We're just to sin away because we're not under the law. The law is what keeps us from sinning. Moralistic people love rules and lists. And they always try to impose those rules and lists on other people. We'll come back to that in a minute. Just just keep that in mind. This moralistic person shows up and basically has the same objection from Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? We're under grace, let's just sin away. In both cases, he says, 
no way. Because what these questions expose is that people really don't understand the transforming power of grace at all. Moralistic people do not understand the transforming power of grace. They're afraid that they're going to mess up. Grace actually frees us and empowers us to live to God. Grace is not a license to sin, is what Paul's saying. Grace frees you from your slavery to sin. And it frees you to pursue righteousness and God and joy in Christ. Grace produces new living from the new life that it generates. Grace fundamentally transforms the whole person, not just the external. Moralism can modify the external. It cannot transform the internal. Let me, just, let me just say this. Why you do what you do matters as much as what you do. Say that again. Why you do what you do matters just as much as what you do. Because there is a way that we can live that looks good on the outside and is utterly filthy and riddled with carcasses of sin on the inside. So what does he do? Paul says, by no means, verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as an obedient slave, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey, either to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness? Let me ask you this. Do you think that God is honored by duty-driven obedience? Do you think he is honored by a person that out of a sense of moralistic responsibility and duty, out of fear, maybe, does what he's supposed to do outside, on the exterior, in this external veneer, and has... And, and does it with a sense of duty mumbling under his breath. Well, I guess I have to go to church. That's what good Christians do. Well, I guess I got to go help out and do this because that's what good Christians do. Is that honoring to God? If, you, if you're a parent, you understand this, right? If, if I tell Finley to pick up her toys and she does it whining. She doesn't, she doesn't like grouch. She whines, right? We've, we've got whiners when they're upset. So when she's upset, she doesn't, oh, oh, fine. Like, if we have a boy, that's probably what'll happen. She like, I don't want to. And like, and like half-heartedly. Now, that, in opposition to Finley Grace, please pick up your toys. Okay, Papa. Da, 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 singing and, da, 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 and picks them all up and he, she gets done I'm like hey there's, there's one over there da, 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 skips over to it right now one of those is honoring and one of those is not here's the point God is not primarily after a moral people now don't hear I'm going to stop right here do not hear me say morality is bad. Don't hear me say that. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that Christ, God, is not, partic or is not primarily after a moral people. Now, how can I say that? Because there are externally moral people that don't know God and are going to go to hell. There are people, if I may be so bold, that attend church every single Sunday. And they will go to hell. That's why I say that God's not primarily after a moral people. So what is he after? He's primarily after a holy people. 1 Peter chapter 2, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. 
He is primarily after a Christ-like holy people. So go over with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 13 to 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. So right there, the first thing we see is there is a reorientation of hope. We're setting our hope on something else. We're setting our hope on the grace of God that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct. So, did you catch what's going on there? Holy people are moral people. Not all moral people are holy people. The basis for holiness is that as obedient children, it's what we are, what we want to be, our spirit, our self bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, fellow heirs with God, or fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. Spirit himself helps us in our weakness, for we don't know how to pray. We cry out, Abba, Father, right? Obedient children, that's what we want to be. Obedient children aren't conformed to former passions they had when they were ignorant to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Peter's saying here, right? Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So there's a reorientation of passion. My passion was for the world and sin in my former ignorance. The gospel came I changed, something happened, there was a transformation, and now my passion is for God in Christ, and I pursue that, and that leads to holy living, right conduct. You see that pattern there? You see that cycle that he's going through? If you have passions before when you were ignorant, you get enlightened by the the eyes of your heart and your mind being opened by the, the gospel being preached and the the Spirit doing work, and we see Christ, and we pursue Christ, and He is our passion now. And the result of that is we are holy in all of our conduct. You're holy because He's holy, and your passion is for Him. Same thing was said in the Old Testament. You shall be holy, for I am holy. What was the problem? They went chasing after the balls and the astros. They found every excuse in the world to chase something other than God. Who had passion for God? David-type people had passion for God. His pursuit of holiness was a result of God being holy. Therefore, his pursuit of God was a pursuit of holiness. You delight in him. You have a passion for him, a longing for him, a loving of God that produces holiness in all of your conduct because he's holy and you want to be more like him. It's much deeper than external conformity. So this is why I say that God is not primarily after moral people. He's after holy people. It's the difference between Christ and the Pharisees. Were the Pharisees moral? Yes. Absolutely. Christ was holy. It's interesting to see the interactions between the moral people and the holy God. Isn't it? What are you doing, Jesus? You're hanging out over there with drunk people. That's not a very moral action, Jesus. You're drinking with sinners over here, Jesus. 
Those of us in the moral high ground would never do anything like that. What are you doing talking to prostitutes? Being alone with a woman at a well. The moral people were always gauging Christ's morality against theirs. Now, was Christ moral? Yes. Was he holy? So there is a way to be holy that is separate, distinct from the world that doesn't cause you to abandon the world but actually drives you to other sinners because you want them to experience this holiness that you've experienced. Moral people are focused on what one refrains from doing. This is, let me list out some differences here. Moral people are focused on what one refrains from doing. They're focused on external things. A holy person is focused on what he can do. I have been freed from the slavery of sin to pursue God. That's right there in Romans chapter 6, right? Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as an obedient slave, you're the slaves to the one who obey, either to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? And a little bit earlier, in verse 13, do not present your members to sin as instruments of righteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. A holy person is focused on what he can do. It originates from our love for and relationship with God. It's from the heart. A moral person refrains from wrong actions. Holy people hate the very thought of doing wrong. Moral people are driven by what people, people perceive them to be. In other words, it's man-centered. Holy people are driven by, by, by what God wants them to be. They're God-centered. Moral people fear punishment. Holy people aim to please and honor their holy father by reflecting him. Okay, fearing punishment, condemnation, means you're not a child. There's now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So our motivation now as holy people is fundamentally different. It's not out of a fear of punishment, it's out of love for our holy father. My, moral people mindlessly follow a list. Holy people aim to please and honor, or I'm sorry, holy people ponder what brings pleasure to their father. At its fundamental level, even with all of the imperatives here in the New Testament, this book is not a list of things to do. It's a revelation of God so that you might see him and love him and ponder and think about how to please him. You know, there's a lot of specific situations that are not covered in the Bible. Do I move to this place or this place? Do I take this job or this job? A holy person ponders what pleases my father, not just mindlessly following a list. Moral people get their sense of right and wrong from the world. Holy people don't conform to the world because they have been transformed internally. Moral people live by their own definitions of what's right and wrong and, and live and love to impose those on others. Holy people allow the word to direct their lives and they guard, listen to this, they guard the silences of the Bible honoring the differences and freedom allowed for those who love the same Savior. Did you catch that? Moral people love to impose their definitions of morality on others. Holy people speak where the Bible speaks, are silent where the Bible is silent, and when the Bible is silent, they give the freedom that Christ has given us to other people and allow them to live out their varying convictions, convictions without being a jerk. So, Christ has empowered us through our union with him, by, be, by dying with him and being raised with him to new life, to actually walk in a new pattern of living. 
So where does this obedience come from? It comes from the heart. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committing. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves to righteousness. Slavery reveals who your true master is. Living to God, pursuing holiness, heart-driven obedience reveals that you belong to God, as imperfect as it may look in your life. Utter disregard for God and his holiness and his commands and his will and his desire reveals that your, your slavery to sin shows you who your master is. Which means that you've never been saved. And this is why this issue of, of God honoring obedience is so important. What is God honoring obedience? God honoring obedience is obedience that flows from the heart. From a heart that's been changed and transformed. Look at what he says in verse 17. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Who changed your heart? Who changed your... Think about that for a second. Who changed your heart? God did that. God did that. That's why Paul can give all the glory to God by saying thanks be to God at the beginning. If you did that, this verse would look very different. It would read something like this, but thanks be to you that you who were once slaves of sin changed your heart to become obedient. You see how that doesn't work? That thanks be to God is all glory, all honor, all praise, all adoration, all thanks go to God because he fundamentally did something to transform believers that you and I were incapable of doing. And what he did results in new life, new living, new love, new affections, new actions because we have new hearts that seek and treasure God above everything. He doesn't say thanks to you because you mustered up the internal willpower to change your heart. In Matthew 15, 8 to 9, Christ says these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I ask myself, what, what does that look like? I think it looks like Luke six forty six. When Christ says, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I say? Lips, honoring with the lips, calling him Lord. Their hearts are far from him. You don't do what I say. Why do you call me Lord? Your lips are saying something that your heart, which is, by the way, the control center for all of your actions, is not matching up with. Does our speech match up with our action? Does it, our speech match up with our motivation? You can say all the right things and have wicked hearts that have not been transformed. Another way to think about it is this, Matthew chapter 7. On that day there will be many that say to me, Lord, Lord. Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we show up to church every Sunday? I'm reading a little bit in here. Didn't we read, show up to church every Sunday? Didn't we help with VBS? Didn't we participate in small groups? Didn't I serve on the elder board? Wasn't I a deacon? Didn't I give faithfully? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Said, What's happening there? The lips, their profession, their, their, what they're saying is not matching up with their hearts. Therefore, your doing is on the basis of what has been done by God and rooted in his work and grace. Therefore, you 
not only have the power to obey, that is a new heart, but you have the fuel for worship, that is God acting to bring that obedience about. And that results in God honoring obedience from the heart. This is a key distinction between the moral person and the holy person. Unbelievers can be moral. A moral person is obedient by, because of fear. This is why Paul can say things like disobedience leads to death. Look at what he says in, in Romans 6. Romans 6, 16. Right before the verse that we're in. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you, uh, slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, So I take that to mean, based on the full context, if your mouth is saying something and your actions or your heart are saying something else, you are enslaved to sin, and that leads to death, which means that the profession, no matter how many times you professed it, no matter how many prayers you prayed, is not real. Because real gospel transformation has been blood bought by Christ for his people people. Paul says this other, other places too. Romans eight thirteen. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. There is a way for professing believers to live that shows that they're going to hell. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So Christ died to bring us new life in him. We're no longer in Adam. So our passions and our desires do not mirror those of people who are still in Adam. Here's the, here's the point. Our pursuit of obedience is ultimately a pursuit of joy in Christ. Our pursuit of obedience is ultimately a pursuit of joy in Christ. I want to show this to you because this is important. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. I'll put a marker in here for a reason. There we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Okay, grace frees us from slavery to sin. What does it free us to? And we all with unveiled faces are beholding the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord who is spirit. So, The gospel takes root in our hearts. Something fundamentally changes. Blinders are removed. Hearts are open. Ears hear for the first time. And we behold Christ. And all we see is glory, beauty, attractiveness, treasure, joy, peace, contentment, satisfaction, eternal joy in his presence, pleasures forevermore at his side. And that, beholding Christ, beholding the glory of God in the face of Christ, is what transforms us. Not your own individualistic external willpower. It's beholding and seeing the beauty of Christ by the grace of God, seeing who you are in Jesus Christ, recognizing that he bought you from sin and owns you himself, and now you are free by his grace and the blood-brought promises of God to live to him from a new heart. Look at verse, uh, or chapter 4, verses 4 and verse 6. Talking about unbelievers, in their case, the God of this world, that is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What do believers not see when they hear the gospel? They don't see Christ. Believers see Christ, and he's irresistibly attractive. We see him for who he is and what he has done. Look at verse 6. 
How does that happen? For the God who said, let light shine in darkness, the God who created the universe and spoke everything into existence, has said, let, uh, or has shown in our hearts, okay, obedience from the heart, he has shown in our hearts and to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Unbelievers do not see it. Believers see it because God has said, see, light, transformation. If you haven't seen it, Yeah, you can be moral. But your entire life is going to be characterized by frustration and irritation and anger because your morality cannot transform your heart. And all of your external performance is not aimed at God honoring obedience that is derived from a new heart. It's aimed at man-pleasing focus-taking accolades and self. Romans, or Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Go over there real quick. Galatians, Ephesians. There we go. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. 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 The sons of disobedience. Disobedient. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the flesh. Nobody forced us to sin. We wanted it. But God... Verse 4, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ. Which part of that describes you? When we flirt with sin and expect God to deliver us for it, it's like a person putting their, their hand on the burner on the stove and expecting not to get burned. I heard this illustration this week. There was a guy, there's a, there a, a show called Man vs. Beast, apparently. And uh, there was a guy that, that went up to a lion, or a lady or something, that went up to a lion and was like cuddling on the lion. And the lion was like, Wah! and he turned around and got her. And they were talking to the, uh, the trainer, and he's like, I don't know how this happened. Like, this is incredible. Such, I raised this thing from a baby, such a kind little kitty. Never did anything like that. It's a lion. They're designed to kill that's what they do. Like, you know, like, look at the teeth. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. You don't go cuddle a lion. It's like going up to sin and hanging out with sin and saying, well, I'll just test it a little bit. I'll just put my, I'll put my toe in. And it just turns around and bites you and grabs you and rips you up and eats you. And beloved, this is the fuel to fight sin. When we have new hearts, When we have new affections, when we see Christ as he is, it shows sin to be what it is. And we can give ourselves to God and present ourselves to God as obedient slaves rather than running back to sin and giving in to sin, which ultimately does not lead to joy or contentment or happiness, but only shame and guilt and ultimately death. So your pursuit of obedience is a pursuit of Christ. And let me just be bluntly, brutally honest. Some of you need to get serious about sin in your life. Some of you have lived for a long time with an abusive attitude toward grace. And this right here, you being here right now, is God's grace to you to call you to repentance and to Christ to call you out of loving the world and into loving Christ, to call you out of God dishonoring obedience and into God honoring obedience, to cause you, call you out of shame and guilt and sorrow and into joy and pleasures forevermore at his side. 
The primary way we fight sin is by giving ourselves wholly to God and beholding the superior worth and value and beauty of Christ. We see what Christ has done for us and we see the reality of who we are in him and on that basis, we fight sin to the death for superior joy in God. We go to war. So that's throwing out computers and getting rid of smartphones Whatever it takes to pursue our joy in Christ. So why do, you, why do you come to church? Do you come to church because you're a good Christian and that's what good Christians do? Or do you come to church to behold the glory of God? Look, we don't spend a lot of time trying to entertain you. I don't know if you recognize that here at Arbor Drive. We're not concerned with your entertainment. We are concerned with Christ being magnified and glorified, which is why we sing songs that are riddled with the words of God from Scripture and pointing us to Christ. That's why we spend 45 minutes on the sermon pointing to Christ. Why do you come to church? Do you come to church to behold the superior worth and value and beauty of Christ? God-honoring obedience is a gospel-produced, Christ-purchased, grace-empowered, heart-driven pursuit of God in Christ. I know, we're, I know we're a little bit late. Let me just very briefly apply something here. How does this change how we live? Evangelism ceases to be a duty and becomes a joy because we are showing other people the beauty of Christ, which we delight in ourselves. Evangelism isn't just a, pers uh, a persuasion of truth. It's pointing to a treasure it's pointing to the most valuable person in our lives, more valuable than anything you have. And when people see that, that's conversion. Evangelism is pointing to Christ as our supreme treasure. And when he is your supreme treasure, that's conversion. When you see Christ as attractive, when you long to learn more about him, that'll cause you to open up your Bible. That'll cause you to see Sunday morning as a joy. It transforms the way that we handle giving. It stops being about percentages and questions of, well, is it gross or net? Is it before tax or after tax? If I get a gift from somebody, do I need to take 10% and put that into the church offering plate? You see how moralistic that is? how duty-driven that is, it ceases to be about that and becomes a joyful act of worship for the sake of the kingdom and the advancement of the glory of Christ on this earth. Family discipleship is not just something we do because we, we have to, but it's a joyful exaltation of Christ in our homes and to our children with the prayerful anticipation and hope that God will shine light into their hearts, that they will see the same beauty that we see. It changes our priorities in life. It changes the way we look at the Bible and read the Bible because we read it to behold Christ. It changes how preferences are. They don't, they're not king anymore, but they're joyfully surrendered and seen as a barrier for somebody else to see Christ. Carly said this once, and close with this. It brings me joy to see others take joy in the object of my joy. It brings me, this was, I, I was like, I need to write that down quick or I'm going to forget it. It brings me joy to see others take joy in the object of my joy. Are you characterized by joy and love and contentment in God? We tend to immediately jump to behavior without giving the fuel. We need a bigger view of God, a bigger view of Christ. New life is not primarily about doing the wrong stuff or doing the right stuff. New life is about a new heart and new loves and new affections that create and drive and motivate new actions. It's about transformation, not modification. So God-honoring obedience is a gospel-produced, Christ-purchased, grace 
empowered, heart-driven pursuit of God in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have redeemed us and purchased us, given us grace, given us new hearts, given us the gospel to empower our obedience that is honoring to you as we pursue our joy in Christ. Thank you that our obedience and joy are not at odds with one another, that they are tied together in the person and work of Jesus Christ, and that you have not left us on our own, but that you have given us your spirit, that you have given us new hearts, and that you have freed us from the the bondage and slavery to sin that we were once under so that we may now joyfully run to your arms and delight your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's in his name we pray.